some of you might not be ready to hear this, but it needs to be said. The Evil Within? That game is so much better than any of the Resident Evil remakes that have come out. It's not even close. I'm saying The Evil Within is better than the Resident Evil 2 remake, the Resident Evil 3 remake, the Resident Evil 4 remake, and chuck in Resident Evil Village as well while we are at it. Heck, I'll go as far as to say The Evil Within is the king of AAA survival horror gaming, and it's only gotten better with age. That's right. I'm replaying The Evil Within in 2024 and somehow it's still the most unique, thrilling and interesting experience that is currently available. I also want to call out some BS that I noticed back in the day when The Evil Within launched and that was the fact that it got reviewed by people who didn't understand what makes a great survival horror game to begin with. We are going to go over everything. The gorgeous graphics, the id engine getting pushed out, the gameplay that offers a lot more options than any other survival horror game to this day. Straight up action? Check. Stealth and sneaking around? Check. Avoiding booby traps and seeing traps of your own? Check. Having a massive selection of upgradable options to ensure each playthrough is different and actually impacts the game? Check, check, and check. Now, in case you're new here and the fact that I just took a massive dump on the Resident Evil series, you might think I'm just a Resident Evil hater. And look, that's fair enough. Multiple truths can exist at the same time. Not every game can be number one. And just because that spot belongs to the Evil Within does not mean that the Resident Evil 2 remake was not an amazing game, because it was. Same with Village and Resident Evil 4 Remake has a lot of strong points as well. But you know what? Screw them today. The Resident Evil series sells mega numbers and the Evil Within series is effectively dead. Thanks to many not appreciating just how incredible this game series was to begin with and also because Microsoft kills anything they touch and Tango Gameworks is gone. We will likely never see the Evil Within 3 now. That dream is dead. So that leaves us with replaying the first two games and today we are focused on the first. Allow me to either teach you or remind you why this game should live rent free in your mind today. In 2014, which that's right, 10 years ago, The Evil Within came out on the PlayStation 3, the Xbox 360s and PC. It was a big deal because survival horror was literally dead at this time. Capcom had given up, Resident Evil 5 was pure action, and Resident Evil 6 left a horrible taste in everyone's mouth. Survival horror was considered a niche, and since these types of games normally come with photorealistic graphics, it was an expensive price tag as well. This was still during a time where game developers were trying to call of duty everything and the more action the better. There's a reason why in Resident Evil 6, Chris Redfield is literally punching boulders out of the way. But our hero, Shinji Mikami, the man known for his involvement with the original Resident Evil series, came on a mission. A mission to show survival horror could survive in a modern AAA landscape of gaming. Now, enough with the backstory. Let's talk about everything The Evil Within does right. Starting with its world and pacing. From the moment you first get control over your character, I was already seeing attention to detail I had not witnessed before. It was raining, and I was wearing this stylish long coat jacket as a detective. Nice. Anyway, as I stood in the rain, I realized I could see my jacket slowly becoming more wet on the back as it stained my jacket. Normally in a game, if a character was caught in the rain, the materials just became extra shiny, but this looked really realistic and I was impressed to see such attention to detail on something which many other players probably overlooked. But I'm a graphics perv and I live for things like this. I also noticed Kidman, the female cop, had her shirt slowly getting wet as well and the texture work of seeing her skin between the folds of the wet material was a first and frankly, I don't think I've ever seen another game 
where a character caught in the rain looked so well wet and in such a realistic manner. Already I had noticed two details which impressed and these were not even things the game was trying hard to draw attention to. Heck, probably people didn't even notice to this day. Moving to the next scene of interest and this is just pure magic as far as setting the tone goes. You pass out and wake up upside down with your feet tied to a rope in the air. You're surrounded by dead bodies and not everyone is dead as a crazy butcher man comes and hacks a person alive who was right beside you and drags half a body to a table to continue to rip apart. Eventually you untie yourself and fall to the ground. You are made to feel like you're literally a wild animal and you're terrified. You have no weapons and the only tool you have is you're given the prompt to crouch. As you crouch against a wall and watch the monster tear into the human like he was nothing but a piece of tasty steak, the killer slowly walks out of sight and of course, having decided you're likely next, you want to leave. Sadly the door within reach is locked and that's when you realise the key is, key you need is right beside the table. <sighs> With the butcher victim right there. It's not long before the killer is aware of you and starts chasing. You have no weapons of course. So you run and the game quickly becomes a literal death trap. A lever is pulled and sharp blades come out of the wall and a series of other deadly traps that will one hit kill you if you slack off for even a moment. Oh, is this all too easy? Of course not, but the game decides to have your leg injured and now you have to hop around with a painful animation the whole way and uh, you're just pushing through as you're limping. Let's have you fall into a literal pool of blood as well because why not? The stage is set and the evil within makes it very clear very early on that anything is possible in this nightmare you have become a part of. An iconic and terrifying part is a scene where you hide in a locker. By this stage you have already died many times, trying to escape this psycho and now you can hide. Awesome. Well, it is until you bear witness to the killer Sparta kicking a door off its hinges and watching the door crash to the other side of the room. The door having hit a hanging light on the way and now the light is dancing all over the place and casting terrifying shadows as the crazy butcher man with a chainsaw angrily thrashes about the room and you're holding your breath. Both the detective you are controlling and let's be real the player as well, we all hold our breath and don't release the breath until he has left the room. This is just the starting area of the game and just wow is all I have to say. The evil within has you running for your life for a good hour or so before the game even thinks of giving you a weapon. It was clearly important to the developers that you know your place and it's literally at the bottom of the food chain. I think the crazy butcher is a nice symbolic hint of that. It also teaches you that stealth plays a part in this, something literally not possible in the Resident Evil games. You even find empty bottles all over the place so you can throw them around to create noise and create diversions. Now, let's slow down the pace of this video for just a moment to admire the graphics and the visuals of this masterpiece of a game. The id engine, most famous for its use in the Doom series, did an amazing job and while this is max out PC footage, we are still talking about a game designed for the PlayStation 3. Look at the particles in the air as we admire the lighting. I often found myself not moving and just taking in the atmosphere. A PlayStation 3 game aiming for photorealism has no right to still look this good 10 years later, a decade later, it has no business looking this good still, but it does. The game also has some of the best depth of field I have ever seen in a game and it holds up amazingly well. It's not an aggressive depth of field where everything is super blurred in the distance, but it's enough to notice and it does a great job of blending things together at a glance, making game objects and the world come together in a convincing way. Normally games from this generation, you can tell everything is a set piece, but in The Evil Within, things normally look like you're watching a well-polished film instead. Now, 
back to talking about the actual game, we will return to the graphics department later. Now, as has become custom with my videos, a friendly reminder that video games should be about escapism and not activism. If you feel the same and you are tired of watching game franchises get destroyed for no good reason, hit subscribe right now. It only takes a moment to empower voices like mine and it's a team effort. I'll always put the games themselves first. Now, back to the evil within and thank you. You just made my day if you are the one who hit the subscribe button right now. Alrighty, let's talk gameplay. Apart from running for our lives and the tone set so beautifully, what impressed the most in 2014 and even more today in 2024, because it's still unmatched, is the amount of options you have as a player. Most survival horror games, again, let's use the Resident Evil remakes as our most recent examples, only has the ability to shoot and run. Maybe some melee, but that's about it. You're not taking in your environment, looking for things to help you or trying to hide. You either have the ammo and gun to deal with the zombies in front of you, or you run. In The Evil Within, it's a completely different ball game. Firstly, the game's enemies have really smart AI and it's darn hard getting those headshots in. Enemies move erratically once they know of your existence and even zigzag at times. So while you may have enough ammo for the job, will your shots land? Not always and sometimes the weakest enemies will kill you, keeping you humble. This is great for a number of reasons. The first is tension. Any encounter could kill you, but also it encourages you to be stealthy as you again have the ability to do uh, takedowns with a knife. This knife won't break and will always be here with you. It encourages you to hide, play at a slower pace as you observe the enemy's animations and try to figure out the best time to attack. Plus, gives you a spare moment to take in the gorgeous graphics and that depth of field. An interesting component that Evil Within has is how it treats fire. And by that, I mean everything burns with fire and is your best friend. After an enemy is killed, their body just does not vanish magically. It stays on the floor. Sometimes they get back up and other times you enter new areas where, they are, where there's already dead bodies lying about and it's not too rare that one of them is faking it. <laughs> and they get back up and they try to kill you. This means you need to be on edge, as even the dead can trick you. This can be handled by throwing a lit match on the bodies and they erupt in flames immediately. Almost like they're covered in alcohol, it's a little bit funny. The sound of the burning bodies and the warm orange glow that briefly lights up to for the otherwise dark areas is very inviting. You don't have unlimited matches though, so you need to pick and choose when you will do this. If there are multiple bodies together, they will all burn with a single match. And even better, if you time the moment you light these bodies on fire with the exact moment an approaching enemy is attacking, they will as well light up and it counts as a one hit kill. Fire is very powerful in this world and in terms of the lore of the game, those who of you who know, you know why fire is so powerful in this world. Let's discuss what easily is the most unique aspect of the evil within, and that is the crossbow. In this game, it is more powerful than even your shotgun blasting an enemy up close, and it's a lot of fun and offers a lot of options. The crossbow has many different bolts with different effects. You have your standard harpoon-like bolts. They are big, pointy, and can literally pin enemies to the wall. The actual bolt stays in the enemies as well, so it's satisfying to see an enemy run after you while a bolt to their head or crutch comes with them. The other bolts is what makes things quite interesting and adds a lot of personality to your experience. You have spiked bolts that are motion detected, explosives that stick to enemies and surfaces. So if you shot an enemy with it, it will explode and it will do nice area damage to also other en enemies around. But if you shot it at the wall instead, or say the other end of a ladder, you can stand at a safe distance away and watch it explode when an enemy approaches. This adds some nice strategy to the experience to cover multiple directions during moments you are swarmed. 
There is also a bolt that freezes enemies, letting you shatter them into ice particles, a bolt that acts as an electric rod and zaps everyone within reach, Pikachu style, and another which is a blinding flash, making everyone in the area get dizzy and even lets you do some stealth takedowns during the confusion. Speaking of customizing your experience, yet another advantage rarely seen in other survival horror games is the ability to upgrade yourself plus your weapons in the most disturbing way possible. <laughs> Staring into broken mirrors, you can warp into a mental institution, where via the help of, yes, shock therapy, you heard that right, you can improve a whole lot of different things to increase your chances of survival. Firstly, you can improve our detective, the actual guy you control, and he has plenty of room for improvement. He's a smoker and it shows, because if he runs for 4 seconds, he falls over and dies from exhaustion. He's useless if you need him to run. So you can upgrade your stamina to run faster, or maybe you would like more health. Perhaps you feel you don't do enough melee damage, or when you heal yourself, there is not enough healing going on. Well, go for it and upgrade, but let's not forget you can also upgrade every single weapon in the game as well. How much damage, clip size, reload speed and more? This is where I really want to hammer home and get the point across that the options is one of the reasons why The Evil Within holds up a decade later so well. Each run through is different since you're deciding on what is important and what is not important. And trust me, upgrades do change how hard or easy this game is. You can completely stuff it up as well, and I respect the game for even letting you do that and not holding your hand. Now, I'm not saying there is only one correct way of doing things, but if you only invest in your ability to punch enemies, for example, while ignoring all other upgrades like I did one time, you're gonna regret it. That's right, I ignored everything the game had to offer. I made it so that when I punched enemies, it did an insane amount of damage. But considering I ignored everything else to do it, it meant boss battles screwed me over because guess what? I couldn't punch them to death, so that was not a wise investment. When you kill enemies, you get this cool green oozy goo brain stuff, right? So you have that incentive to risk dying to take out more enemies, but also you can find that goo hidden in the environment as well. This goo, that is your game currency, so you want to find it so you can do the many upgrades I just spoke of. Also, remember the crossbow? Well, you can build the bolts if you have enough spare parts that you can find all over the place. So you always want to be exploring, killing, crafting, and thinking seriously about your upgrades. Even with all of these tools at your disposal, the game is still very hard and will kick your butt often. So sometimes it's worth scoping locations out and locating traps. Sometimes a lever will have spikes burst out of the ground and you know what? It would be a darn shame if some enemies happen to be standing there at the time the spikes burst out. Just saying there's some creative evil ways to save ammunition in this game. Due to the nature of the story, your environment changes drastically from one moment to the other. This keeps things interesting as you're never in the same place for too long and even have moments in the bright sun, which don't worry, the game has so much darkness otherwise, you will appreciate it and the graphics look real nice in these scenes as well. Even though the environment changes, the tension does not. You never feel like you can handle everything that comes your way and always manage to just get through. As the game progresses, the action does amp up, but this is paced so well that it's not a problem. By the time you are blasting large group of enemies away, you're near the end of the game anyway, and you have died so many times to get this far, that's just a nice reward to finally be able to get some revenge. The story is super complex as well, always having you on your toes as you try to understand what is going on, finding notes all over the place, and getting excited whenever a cutscene takes place. It's deep, and the expansion packs do explain a great deal more. Special mention definitely needs to be said for the boss designs in The Evil Within. Every single encounter is so memorable. I mean, the first guy with the chainsaw, right? Fighting him, you lose so many 
times and he teaches you to take in your environment, to use your crossbow, to use the different weapons at your arsenal, to do everything possible, right? It's a really tough hill to get over, but once you do, then you realize that the game offers so much more. And then you have the chick with the multiple arms and the long hair chasing you about, smashing your head in like you're nothing. It's terrifying, only fire seems to work on her. She's so OP and memorable and you have multiple showdowns and then you have the cream of the crop the most scary yet interesting character of them all the guy the vault head right the guy with a safe on his head he's chasing you he has his massive hammer he's so intimidating and then it turns out that he can snap his own neck fall down and then just teleport to other safety boxes and just resummon himself an undefeatable foe absolutely traumatizing really sticks in your memory and just i can't really remember that many times in my life where i've actually remembered every single boss encounter because it was so memorable the the way the environment is set with every single confrontation as well things you have at your disposal it's different every time it's so so beautiful so just wanted to really quickly highlight the bosses the characters what you have to go through in order to freaking hurt them oh my goodness and they are the areas of the game where if you've stuffed up your character's upgrade system if you haven't invested in the right places you will know every time you come across a boss who kills you for the hundredth time and you're like hmm I don't think it's meant to be this hard <laughs> A lot of people at release did not appreciate the evil within, and I'll say what the main reason was, and I do not apologize for how blunt I'll say it. Most people sucked at this game. Lots of complaints about the difficulty, and as usual, people always say a game sucks before admitting that maybe they just need to try a bit harder. The game was not Dark Souls hard by any means, but bosses really pushed you and yeah at times felt unforgiving many would even kill you in one shot but pushing but players needed to push through not lie not give horrible um, word of mouth and spread lies that it isn't a great game because it was but of course sore losers will just say something sucks before admitting the game was a bit too hard for them if they just said hey this game's really good but I find it too hard, that would have been acceptable. That would have been an honest thing like, okay, this game is inaccessible to everyone. To some people, this was a bit too hard. But did those people just admit that? No, they instead lied and said the game wasn't that good. And so a lot of people did not give this game a chance, which is why this game's fan base was a slow grower. And as time has gone by and people went and gave the game a chance, just like Days Gone. Remember when Days Gone came out, the reviews weren't so great. We didn't buy it. Many years later, we bought the game. We're like, oh, shite. The game was actually really good. Same thing with The Evil Within. A lot of people discovered it after the fact and thought, holy smoke, this game is good. Good. So to summarize, the characters and story were great, the gameplay offered so many options and customizations, and the graphics still look so darn good. I'll play The Evil Within 2 next and eventually do a video on that as well. While the first The Evil Within game is my favorite by landslide, the second is still fun, and visually, the id engine is put to amazing work. Heck, if they re-release the evil within today with all the modern visual touches, I would rebuy that in a second. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, God bless you all. Take care. Thank you so much for hanging out until the very end of the video. Make sure you have liked it. I enjoyed putting this together. I love The Evil Within. I love survival horror. I cover all gaming news. Feel free to go through my backlog or at the very least, again, hit subscribe. I really appreciate it. Sound off below if you're a fan of The Evil Within and uh, take care. All right, bye-bye.